Now, when it comes to aquaplation, what's very exciting about it is that it becomes almost a size independent procedure. Even I had a patient who I did who had a 220 gram prostate. Now, when we did him, I was very surprised that we had to scope him a little bit about a couple of weeks later. And I looked inside and it was like if someone had taken a cave and dug a straight hole in the middle. It was a perfect circle where you could piece it. You're not going to get rid of a 220 gram prostate for, think of it, um, size of a softball. Mm -hmm. So you're not going to get rid of that in one setting. But what you can do is you can carve an area with the machine that's a perfect lane for you to pee through. Mm -hmm. And that is why it's very exciting because it becomes almost size independent. Well, so far, it, uh, one really compelling advantage does seem to be that size independence, obviously, okay. for, for other procedures like uh, whether it be... You know, um, resume or or Eurolift, really, they seem to put a line in the sand around 80 to 100 grams. So this is kind of opens the the opens the opportunity to bigger prostates like Holup does like simple prostatectomy. But I'm assuming smaller prostates are still fair game for the procedure as well, right? Yes, well, I've pretty much made a cutoff in my mind. And others who are doing aqua ablation as well, we pretty much cut it off at 50 55 cc mm -hmm. prostate. At that point, I tell my patients, if you want to do a procedure that opens it up, you're better off either doing a bipolar term, or if you're concerned about retrograde ejaculation, the idea that when you ejaculate, you don't see any semen, you're better off doing a green light. A larger prostate, when you do a green light, one, it takes longer and there's more irritative symptoms. But a smaller prostate you're doing a green light on, I find there's less irritative symptoms and it's done in an efficacious manner. So for those prostates, I do not believe an aqua ablation offers them a significant greater advantage. And there is an, an increased risk of bleeding with an aqua ablation versus something like a green light laser, a urolith or a resume. And therefore the risk benefit ratio does not favor those prostates. In addition, there are certain shapes of the prostates that I don't feel in my experience of doing of almost 40 cases. I mean, we're working, we have about 10 more coming up, so 50, 60, we'll about half at the end of the month. Um, when you have a significant amount of apical tissue, meaning when you're kind of looking at the prostate, you're looking at it straight down a highway, right? And there's two road barriers. This is what we call the lateral lobes, and they can kind of squeeze you in. And then there could be a nice little roadblock. Think of it as a speed bump. That could be your medium lobe and your bladder neck. The speed bump could, uh, could make it that the urolift is not a good candidate because you can't right. staple something to the ground. Mm -hmm. But if you have significant amount of apical tissue, meaning that the prostate just grows so high it comes around, the aqua ablation doesn't reach that high. And that, when you carve out on the side, it can lead to the top tissue pushing down. Mm -hmm. Those prostates, I think, are not ideal. And if there's a very significant median lobe, what I do, I'll often go and do the rotor rooter first. Because just if you think of a power washer, there has to be a surface that it has to give back tension on. Mm -hmm. If the median lobe, the prostate's going to the bottom, it's just kind of hanging there. There's no, nothing for the, the water will just kind of bounce off of it and it won't get a mouth of significant tissue. So that tissue I tend to eliminate in the beginning. So therefore the whole procedure would go smoother. 